Palm Sunday is a familiar, it's a familiar story. Um, and so we want to start this morning by uh, introducing you to something that we learned this week that was not familiar to us, a new word, or at least a new word in the way that we learned it, which is the word knowingness. Um, it was defined in the 1990s by philosopher and psychoanalyst Jonathan Lear, and he defines knowingness as <clears throat> believing that you already know everything. You have the solution before the question is even asked. You've got it all figured out regardless of what anybody else says. Now, interestingly, he coined this term before there was Twitter <laughs> and Facebook and the online echo chambers that I believe make that magnify this condition a thousandfold. We learned about the word in an article by Jonathan Malasik, uh, who wrote a recent article in Psyche magazine, or my Greek professor would say Psyche magazine. Uh, he relates that in our current culture that does include Twitter and Facebook and all the other stuff, uh, knowingness is the right-wing conspiracist who knows exactly how society is set up to trick us into ignoring terrible things. And, and when confronted by facts that don't agree with his worldview, dismisses known facts as fake news. Knowingness, he said, is the progressive podcaster who is sure that late capitalism is the scourge of every ill in our society. Knowingness is the above-it-all centrist who is sure that neither extreme has any of their facts right and we just need to keep a steady course in the middle. Malasik writes, knowingness is a false claim to knowledge that makes it impossible to learn anything new. Knowingness, he says, is why present-day culture wars are so boring. Right. Because no one is trying to find out anything new. They already know. There is no common agreement about the facts, and yet everyone knows, or acts rather, as if all matters of fact have already been settled. Everyone knows, just knows. That is knowingness. We just had an adult forum led by Fred Golder <clears throat> of Braver Angels, which is a group dedicated to mediated, fair, safe conversations between uh, progressive and conservative thinker, political thinkers in our country. Um, and the key to those conversations going well though Fred did not use this term, is for the folks who enter into those conversations to choose not to bring knowingness, for folks to be able to listen to each other to learn rather than to think they've got the other side all figured out. I would say the work that Braver's Angels does is God's work, really, though I don't know that they would call it that. <clears throat> this year... As Barb and I studied again the story of Palm Sunday, looking at Matthew's version and Luke's and Mark's and John's, and I have to say probably a little bit of Jesus Christ Superstar mixed in there as well, uh, we were, as, as we're going into Holy Week, we were struck by how many of the characters in the gospel story seem to be caught in their own condition of knowingness. They all knew. They just knew. They just knew. The crowds that greeted Jesus knew, just knew who and what they were looking for and waiting for. The crowds were waiting for the conquering Messiah, the Davidic king who would finally defeat Rome and... Uh, God's people would usurp Rome's puppet rulers and priests 
They knew what Jesus was about. They knew the meaning of Zechariah 9.9 that was quoted in Matthew's Gospel. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey. They knew the symbolism of the, of the waving palms when a century and a half before, Simon Maccabeus drove the foreign enemies from Jerusalem and the people celebrated with praise and palm branches, with harps and cymbals. They knew, they just knew what the meaning of all these symbols was. So when Jesus comes with palms and donkey, they knew, just knew what was to come. No wonder they cried out, Hosanna, God save us. They knew what was to come. So the religious leaders of Jesus' day, they didn't love Rome either. But for them to be able to do the religious leading that they wanted to do in their country, they needed to, to create a very delicate balance between not angering Rome and by doing what was needed in their religious duties. And they knew, they just knew, that this religious upstart from Galilee who was talking about reforming Judaism could spark a messianic firestorm that would upend everything they had devoted their lives to creating. They knew, they just knew that this Jesus and his followers needed to be quieted or somehow put aside so that things wouldn't get too out of hand. The disciples each had their own knowingness about Jesus. Simon Peter knew, just knew, that he would be Jesus' right-hand man in the kingdom to come. The sons of Zebedee knew, they just knew, that they had a special place of prestige and power as well. Simon, the zealot, knew, just knew, that a revolution was in the making and that he would be with Jesus at the forefront of a great military battle against the Roman occupation. Now, Judas, I don't know exactly what Judas knew, just knew, was to come. But when it didn't, his disappointment turned into betrayal. And then there's Pilate, the cynical leader that Rome had sent to keep those difficult Israelis quiet. And he had seen any number of would-be messiahs come and go, and he knew, he just knew, that this guy riding into town on a donkey was trouble, that this was an uprising that needed to be put down by any means necessary. And if it took the Roman boot to make it happen, well, it had been done before. It would be done again. He just knew what Jesus meant and what would have to be done with him. Each of these players knew just knew what Jesus was all about. The facts didn't matter. They were sure they knew, just knew what would happen next. Once Jesus rolled into town on that donkey, on that faithful road into town. He road really into rolled town. into town. He didn't roll into town. <laughs> I, I still have Jesus on a, on a Honda on a motorcycle. 750 <laughs> coming in. Right, yeah. They knew what all that symbolism mean, meant. Each was sure that their perspective was the whole picture rather than just their small piece of the whole. Each thought that they could predict exactly what would happen in the coming days because they thought they knew the whole story. And they couldn't or wouldn't hear anything else. But in fact, none of them knew. I don't think any of them knew what was going to come in that final week, at least not the whole picture. 
I don't think anyone in that crowd believed after shouting Hosanna with such enthusiasm on Sunday that by Thursday they would be shouting, crucify him. I don't think the disciples knew, not really, that Jesus was going to be arrested. And they certainly didn't know. They certainly didn't anticipate that all of them would abandon him in his hour of need. I don't even think those nervous religious leaders thought that this was going to end with this guy who made them nervous being strung up on a cross. I'm not sure Pilate even thought that that was going to be the end of where things went, though he was willing to go there if he needed to. For all their knowingness, None of these players could have predicted fully the events that were to come. And once these events culminated cruelly in a crucifixion, everyone was sure, again in their knowingness, that the cross was the end of things. The end of this inconvenient Jesus, the end of the crowd's dreams of liberation, the end of a political uprising, the end of the movement of the disciples. I mean, they knew death is the end, right? Yet, For all their knowingness, none of them could have anticipated what would happen on Easter morning. No one could. But that's a story we'll tell next Sunday. And so as we enter into Holy Week, into this story of the last days of Jesus' life that we all know so well, We bring a gentle warning. Beware of your knowingness. We bring it for you and we bring it for us. Be cautious of what you think you know. You just know. Because we all do it sometimes and it trips us up more often than not. And I don't mean abandon everything, of course. Because we do know that God is love, and that each person on this earth, including this whole earth, is beloved of God, and that God wants to put the world aright and will do so through everlasting and powerful love. As we go into Holy Week, hold on to that. That is the bedrock of our faith. We just suggest that the other things, you might hold them a little more loosely. Be open to other experiences, other perspectives, other outcomes that you might not expect because it's in those unexpected places that God's spirit really gets to work and make something new. In fact, as we journey through Palm Sunday and through Holy Week, we suggest that the character of Palm Sunday that you might want to emulate is the one that's overlooked the most, and that would be the donkey. (laughs) The character with really no knowingness, no preconceived notion of who Jesus was, no dreams of power and prestige, the only player with no pretense, really. Of Everyone in this Palm Sunday scene, the only one not afflicted by knowingness, is the donkey. The donkey just does what donkeys do. They bear their rider, and they go where they're called to go. In this particular situation, on Palm Sunday, there's a Greek term for what this particular donkey does, and it's what I named this donkey whenever I read the story. 
Christophoros, Christ bearer. The donkey bears Jesus. Christopher bears Christ into Jerusalem. Past the crowds, past the disciples, past the religious and political authorities who all know, just know what this Jesus is all about. The donkey, with no presuppositions, bears Jesus simply and humbly stepping forward one step at a time, resolutely, obediently, in service to Jesus. So this Holy Week, we invite you to be Christophers, to be Christ-bearers into the world. To bear Christ humbly into your places of work and play and family and friends. And to bear Christ faithfully into places of cynicism, places of power politics. To bear Christ gently into places of pain and hopelessness. May each of us bear Christ courageously into the Good Fridays of suffering and confusion or loneliness, or whatever grief is yours in this coming week. Because while there is so much we don't know, just know, we do know how the story ends. And we know it's not the end of the story.